Greetings, my friends. Mike Juan here. Gregorian count, February 10th, Gregorian year 2024. And <laughs> we got some weird stuff to unpack. And this is going to be a continuation into the exploration of what the hell's going on with this eclipse. <laughs> All right. So um, I'm going to give a little bit of uh, background information on the eclipse. So the those of you who watched the eclipse video I did a couple weeks ago, um, I'm going to cover some of that stuff again, but then there's going to be new information afterwards. And for those who have not seen the video, that's, you know, this is for you. So we've got the eclipse, which is occurring on April 8th. Uh, I made reference when I made the video a while ago that I'm not certain if the media is hyping up this eclipse to the same degree in which the 2017 eclipse occurred. But uh, people said, yes, they are. And I've gone and looked around. And yes, this is getting hyped up. And the, the X, the X marks the spot. Here is the X location in greater detail. Uh, the location where, you know, whatever an eclipse is, whatever an eclipse path is, um, this is where they overlap as they cross the United States. And when we look closely, we see it's right by this significant um, mound site, Cahokia Mounds. And what I talked about in the last video was how, um, was how not only is the eclipse occurring here and it corresponds to this significant mound site, but also what happened at this mound site was it was one of the locations of the 1987 Harmonic Convergence, which was the world's first synchronized global peace meditation, and it coincided with an exceptional alignment of the solar system. And that happened August 16th through 17th, 1987. Here's an article about it. It shows Cahokia Mounds, um, Bunch of people, they're watching the sunrise, uh, 4.30 a.m. Sunday, um, took place at Coyhokia Mounds, also at other sacred sites, Grand Canyon, Mount Shasta, uh, Inca Ruins, um, Great Pyramids, Mexican Pyramids, Chaco Canyon. One of the things which, like, you want to do or, or try to do when you, when, like, this understanding what's going on is maybe getting into the mindset of what what was consciousness like in 1987 and that's i'll, I'll leave that rhetorical right now i'm not going to answer that question i don't know if i can but recognizing that it was a different world then for a variety of different reasons um and so we're going to be looking deeper right now into this harmonic convergence but let me go and point this out. I don't know if I talked about this so much. Um, this is the this is the uh, astrological map of when the harmonic convergence occurred. This is 4:30 a.m. at this site. I use 4:30 a.m. because that's what it says in this article, and that's my my touch point. And we can see the alignment, this grand trine, and then you know the moon is squaring all of this stuff right here. And the key locations are right here. Uh, in tropical, this is um, said to be uh, in Leo, um, right over here, Sagittarius, and then right up here, Jupiter, uh, right on the cusp between um, Aries and, and Taurus. Now, keep in mind, if this was sidereal, this same triangle would still be in occurrence uh, the difference would be, it's saying it's in different signs, but everything else, like, you know, the, the relationship of all of these planets to each other and the plane of the earth, that doesn't change. And I'm going to use, I'm going to use, um, the signs right now, but just as reference points. So I want to focus on this area right here. Um, 
obviously like Jupiter is the key player in what's being point out, pointed out. Um, but I'm going to say this whole section is of significance because uh, we've got the North Node right here. And the North Node is key for when eclipses occur. An eclipse did not happen on the harmonic convergence, but an eclipse is occurring right here um, at the same place where the harmonic convergence was um, practiced, celebrated. I don't know what word would you want to use. Uh, and so really all of what we're going to call in tropical um, three degrees to 29 degrees um, Aries. This is a specific location in the sky, just like this is a specific location on Earth. This is a specific location in the sky. And we can compare charts and regardless if it's sidereal or tropical, just as long as we're you, if we're comparing charts which are both in the same system, like comparing tropical to tropical or sidereal to sidereal, we know that we're talking about the same part of the sky. So let's go look at the eclipse, um, April 8th, 2 p.m. That's what's going to happen um, here in Illinois. And the eclipse occurs where the sun and the moon are. They're both at 19 degrees uh, Aries. And the third, the third marker to, for an eclipse to occur is there has to be a full moon or a new moon. And it's going to be close to the north or south node. Um, and it doesn't have to be you know, spot on, but it's going to be close. So here we see is the north node, and the north node is 15 degrees uh, Aries. So really from 15 to 19 degrees Aries is where the eclipse is happening in the sky. This is where we're looking at it on Earth, where it's grounded on Earth. And then that overlaps with this section of the harmonic convergence, um, which is we've got the north node here at 3 degrees, here it's at not at 15 degrees so they're in the same general part of the sky they're off by 12 degrees of arc you know don't worry about it if you don't know what the uh you know what the specifics of what you know 12 degrees of arc means but i'm just pointing out like there's a all of the the parallels in which we're seeing in the sky and the parallels we see on the earth <coughs> all right so I've been thinking about this. This has been um, coming into my my consciousness, you know, where my mental space has been over the last couple weeks or so. Um, and I've been doing uh, I've been doing a lot of uh, sessions for people who are interested in seeing how their natal charts correspond to this to get a better understanding of their personal relationship to this and maybe how to prepare, or like what they can do to integrate with it. Um, but that, that encouraged me to begin to think about my, my own self. And something else I've been talking about, at least since the beginning of this calendar year of 2024, was I told the story of like the two dogs in the underworld and how I had that, um, you know, that nasty scratch from, from the Rottweilers. And when I talked about that in a video in, I'd say probably mid-January, I made reference to the fact that this was not the first time in my life that I had been um, scarred by two dogs. And I said once when I was in high school, two German shepherds attacked me. And I have scars on the back of my leg, on the back, or like on my calf, on the back of my calf, on my left leg, and the scratches on the, um, from this January from the Rottweilers was on my left thigh. And I was just aware of that similarity and, and I was talking about that. So I know when the the dog attack, the first dog attack occurred. It, it happened when I was a sophomore in high school. It happened, um, I had a, a, a stress fracture in my foot and it was during high school preseason soccer, and I was unable to um, participate in soccer practice because my foot was broken, uh, and, but I had to be there. So I was just walking around uh, the school grounds when I came upon these two German shepherds, which is when the whole thing happened. Um, I was a sophomore in high school. I, uh, 
from 1987 was was September when school began and you know the school year ended in um, June of 88. Soccer season was fall for where I went to school and so preseason began I was August 15th and it was right in the very beginning of preseason when the attack happened. So it happened the week of the harmonic convergence. My dog attack was sometime between August 15th and August 20th of um, 1987, which was when the harmonic convergence occurred. So I'm like, all right, that's, <laughs> that's an interesting coincidence. And then I began unpacking this a little bit more in my life. Um, I'm currently in a relationship with a woman. I've been in a relationship with her for over a year. And her birth date, she was born September 2nd, 1987. So two weeks after this convergence. And the relationship I was in uh, before this, the relationship I'm currently in, there was a good year in between, um, of no relationship, but the woman who I was in a relationship with before, and I was, that was a three year relationship, her birthday, her birthday, she was born August 15th, 1987. And then also interestingly, uh, during the time between those two, um, those two relationships, uh, I had a friendship. Um, this guy just kind of like popped in my life for a short period of time. And this was all in the midst of like this Freemasonic uh, uh, presentation, which I've made reference to so many times. Uh, he was born in late August, 1987. So now I've got these four personal points. I'm like of of me and this time period, like seemingly nothing to do with like, you know, astrological or, 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 or harmonic convergence, but there are some really interesting markers as how it touches me. And this is a, a fine practice, like which we should all do when kind of understanding our relationship with life is like the greater life, the life which we're all participating in is you use your own life as the point of reference because, you know, that's what you've got. You know, you've got that. And then from there, you begin to expand outwards. So it was from those recognitions that I began to realize, like, all right, somehow I'm connected to this too. Like, you know, how or why, I don't know. So I began searching. So now it's going to get really interesting. So... August 16th, 1987, right? August 16th, 1987. August 16th, 1987 was the Northwest Airlines Flight 255 plane crash. It was a big deal. It happened at 8.45, 8.46 p.m. It happened in the Detroit area. Um... It was the second deadliest aviation accident at the time of the United States. And it's also the deadliest aviation accident to have a sole survivor. 140, 148 of the 149 passengers died. Um, two people on the ground, all six crew members. So what is that math? That's 150, 156 people um, perished in this crash. So just as the harmonic convergence is going underway, this flight crash occurs. And like, again, put yourself in the context of um, 1987. Uh, there was cable TV then, but there wasn't the internet, or at least the World Wide Web, DARPANET and so forth. ARPANET was still around, but it wasn't really the, the way which we think of the internet. Um, currently, it was still only done... Um, really in, in universities and military, there was no, there was no like GUI interface, which is what created the World Wide Web. Um, so cable TV was the primary like way of getting information. There was not information overload. You did not have infinite choices of what information you would put in your mind. So this was a huge story. It was the plane took off and it crashed shortly after takeoff, and it crashed onto a highway. 
you know, so you could just imagine the amount of, of, of public, uh, um, of public, uh, um, uh, response to it. Like, you know, this is like out of a movie and like, overshadowing i don't know how big of a deal harmonic convergence was outside of the new age circles which were practicing or participating within the harmonic convergence but this is overshadowing it and this is going on um at that same day and it wasn't just that it wasn't just a plane crash uh there was a sole survivor and the sole survivor was this four-year-old girl so I found this article right here. This four-year-old girl's name was Cecilia um, Sichon. I don't know how to pronounce this last name. Uh, this is the grandfather and um, it says like the brother-in-law and the brother. So there was a girl, she was flying with her mother and her father and her brother and they all perished and this little four-year-old girl um, is discovered and so the whole world is like freaking out over this plane crash and then like oh my god we found this four-year-old girl can you imagine this like this is uh to this day it's the the most devastating uh in terms of number of casualties uh of of a plane crash with the sole survivor and we've got like, I mean, if you want to go into it, we've got like a whole bunch of this, like 33 CC here. This is from this article. It says, Catherine Curiton, information officer for the medical center, you know, another CC. The girl's father was 33 or no, the, the mother was 33. The father was 32. So, you know, read into that, whatever you want. It's certainly there. Uh, look at this little face right there. That looks like a little something. All right. <clears throat> so where to go with this? So this here's the father. It's um, the little girl's name is Cecilia. Her father um, dies, and I found reference to the father. Um, he was buried in um, Pennsylvania. He was buried in George Washington Memorial Park. Uh, you could see that he died on. August 16th, 1987 in Romulus. You know, this is Romulus, like Remus and Romulus, Michigan is where it happened. That's where this plane crash occurred. Um, so it's the same one. We see this guy, oh, this is what it says. Michael died in the crash, flight 288. Um, so we've got this, this gravestone. I'm just kind of like, I'm dropping all sorts of, of data points right now. I don't even know where I'm going with this, but there's, there's a there there. I'm still unpacking it, but I figured I'd just share it with you guys. Um, if you're familiar with my work, if you're familiar with my work with Ross Ben, uh, a lot of Ross Ben's work, well, where mine and Ross Ben's work really overlaps has to do with the Rosicrucians in Pennsylvania in the 1600s. And he's always making reference to this thing called Kelpius Cave, where the Rosicrucians used to meet in the um, colonial days outside of Philadelphia. So this right here is George Washington Memorial Park. This is George Washington Memorial Park, where the burial was. This here is Kelpius Cave, and we could see it's about seven miles away. Um, I've made a lot of reference to like the Kobe Bryant helicopter crash. And I said how the Kobe Bryant helicopter crash, which occurred in, um, in Los Angeles, corresponded to a helicopter crash that occurred in Lower Marion Township in 19, I think it was 1990. Kobe Bryant played his basketball in Lower Marion. Uh, and like, I mean, I'm assuming you're familiar with a lot of this stuff, but John Hines, 57, that was the whole Freemasonic thing for me was telling that story. Um, this right here is where Lower Marion High School is. This right here is the is where that grave marker is, another eight miles away. So again, like somehow this story is linked into time, space, uh, narrative to this highly charged area. Um, slightly, you know, worth noting in this, 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 this story, which we're, we're unfolding is Virginia Dare. Virginia Dare, if you're not familiar, is, is, uh, 
fantastical myth of early American history. Um, I did a really good video on it like years ago. Um, I've talked about Virginia Dare a lot, but I'm going to skip those details and just go to the basics. So the claim to fame of Virginia Dare is that she is the first English child born in the New World. So if you're familiar with what's known as the Lost Colony of Roanoke, so before Jamestown, which happened in 1607, which came 19 years before, uh, I guess less than 19 years, maybe 15 years before Plymouth Rock, where the pilgrims were, the first English attempt at a colony was called, was called the Roanoke, and it supposedly disappeared. It's known as the Lost Colony of Roanoke, which was located in you know, in our modern vernacular, would call it the Outer Banks of North Carolina. And Virginia Dare was a girl who was buried, or she was born there. She was the granddaughter of the governor of the colony of Roanoke. Uh, she was the first person baptized in um, the English church in the New World. Like, there's all of this, like, rich symbology to it, like the name Virginia Dare. <clears throat> So the things which are interesting about it is within, so the Virginia Dare story takes place in the late 1500s, but she did not become this mythological character until like the 1800s. Like it's a total propagandized story is where I'm getting at it. And part of the stories of Virginia Dare was not only was she the first born, but she was the sole survivor of whatever happened to all of the people who died in the loss or disappeared in the lost colony. And so she's a sole survivor and she was like a young girl. And, you know, we've got this sole survivor sort of um, uh, mythology going on. But you go and you look at Virginia Dare's birth date and her birth date is August 18th, 1587. So that is... Um, Almost 400 years to the day, August 16th, 1987, August 18th, 1587, like there's this Virginia Dare narrative. And Virginia Dare ties also into this concept of the woman of the wilderness because she was said to have been raised in the wilderness. And that ties in also to Kelpius Cave because the reason why they were out there, uh, the, the Wissahickon monks, is because they were... They called themselves like the, was it the cult of the, the, the society of the, the woman of the wilderness, which ties into all sorts of different archetypes, including like, um, end of days stories, but also just general wild woman archetypes. And that's why dare comes in as well. Like, you know, dare requires a certain gumption if someone dares you. So this is part of our, our story as well. Um, so let me read from this article for a minute. Uh, this is from the newspaper at the time. If you read the Wikipedia story of, of the plane crash, you know, it, it feels very like dull. There's no emotionality to it. You know, it was 40 years ago. Um, but when you go and you read some of the stories from when it happened, you, you get a, a greater feel of the emotionality that was tied into the story. So, um, Northwest called with confirmation of the passenger list about 3 a.m. Monday. So the plane crash took place at eight o'clock in the evening. So it probably was already all over the news at eight o'clock and then at three in the morning, the next day, right when all of the harmonic convergence is going on, you know, that is this global peace sort of meditation, which is happening. Uh, we've got this, this other story, which is gathering all sorts of attention. And they assume, so I'm assuming I, I cut this from the middle of the article. They, I assume is Northwest assumed that Cecilia had been killed with her parents and her brother, that there were no survivors. Then at 9 a.m. on CNN, a reporter came on and said they found a little four-year-old girl who was alive. So imagine you've got all of these 
watchers of TV who are emotionally tied into this story of this horrific plane crash and there are no survivors. And then a reporter comes on to like, we found a four year old girl. She's alive. Like a mat. Like this is straight out of a, out of a movie. Uh, the rescue worker said he heard screaming and thought, and thought it was an adult. And believe me, little Cecilia could scream like an adult. Um, and then it goes on, and this is from the grandfather. The grandfather who we see right here is telling the story. And he says that, um, I called the hospital and I told, I told them to look for braided hair and fingernail polish and a chipped tooth. Like the more you can imagine this, the more real this becomes in the viewer's mind. And sure enough, it was from this painted girl's fingernails that they were able to match her and identify her. And I mean, just to imagine the story, which is being, um, which is being, um, told or possibly sold to the public. Um, and somehow this is, this is being tied into like, you know, this little girl who survives all of this stuff, like something new is being born. And this little girl, 33 CC is the lone survivor, uh, uh, real Italian name in Romulus, Michigan, Romulus, is, Remus and Romulus are the founders, the mythological founders of Rome, um, and this is very similar to Virginia Dare because this is the story of the British Empire, like Virginia, Queen Elizabeth, the Virgin Queen. Like this is her story, her mythology, which is like sold, which is sold to like, you know, common humanity. So we can see these sort of like these mirrors, uh, re, uh, mirroring storytelling occurring. So <clears throat> I didn't remember. I don't remember that story of the plane crash from when I was a uh, sophomore in high school in 1987, but I do remember this story. Um, later on in 1987 was the story of baby Jessica. Uh, and baby Jessica fell down a well and for, she was an 18 month old and um, she fell down a well in Midland, Texas, and um, it was a huge story. For, four, for, for 50 hours, I think she was down there. It was like the biggest story in the world. Let's see what this says right here. Um, New York Times columnist Lisa Belkin wrote a, re a retrospective article in 1995 on the impact of live video news. So we heard about CNN, um, CNN being the first to announce about the survivor of the little girl from the plane crash in August, 1987. And then in October 14th, 1987, uh, CNN, uh, covers the story of this little Jessica who falls down the well in Midland. If a picture is worth a thousand words, then a, th then a moving picture is worth many times that. And a live moving picture makes an emotional connection that goes deeper than logic and lasts well beyond the actual event. This was before correspondence reported live from the enemy capital while American bombs were falling, before Saddam Hussein held a surreal press conference with a few of the hundred of Americans he was holding hostage. So we, we see, we see like this, this, these markers in our collective history of media and storytelling. Um, where am I going to go with this? So little girl who beat the odds, 1987. So it wasn't just this little four year old Cecilia who survived. Um, we then have the rescue of Jessica McClure. Um, over the next uh, she falls into a well in her aunt's backyard in Midland, Texas, 18 months over the next 56 hours, rescuers work to free her from the well. The story gammered worldwide attention. 1989, they made a TV, uh, movie about it. And so here we see little Jessica McClure. Um, where are we going to go with this? So here's some more details about the story and the emotionality and how this was told. Um, so let's talk about this for a moment. <clears throat> the Simpsons. We all know about the Simpsons as a, 
as a predictor, like its role in, in predictive programming and whatever the role the Simpsons are, much like the Illuminati card game, which seemingly is spot on sometimes, many of the times. Uh, there was a episode, season three, episode 13, aired 1992, called Radio Bart. Lisa catches Bart imitating Timmy's voice. Uh, so I'll start from the beginning. Bart ends up losing a radio down a well and plays this to his advantage, tricking the townspeople into thinking an orphan named Timmy O'Toole had fallen down the well. They, although they were unable to rescue Timmy since the well was too small to accommodate him as an adult, the entire town offers its love and moral support. Krusty persuades Sting to join the other celebrities to record a charity single called We're Sending Love Down the Well. Um, and they're basically showing how uh, this is a Simpsons-inspired um, story of baby Jessica. Now, this happened in 1992, five years after the actual story of Jessica. Um, interestingly enough, Jessica McClure... Uh, McClure is a last name, I believe, which is used in The Simpsons. Isn't it Troy McClure? And then also, I know in this article, they made reference between the importance of the O.J. Simpson slow ride in, in the Bronco, obviously Simpson. We've got, we've just got like all of this sort of like similar phonetics, you know, the, the language of the birds, green language is playing out in the backdrop of our collective consciousness through this, you know, this storytelling. Um, Also interesting right here is this is telling the story of the Flight 255. Um, the flight crashed into Middle Belt Road. Uh, Jessica McClure happens in Midland, Texas. So there's this mid, you know, take that whatever you want, mid media. I mean, that's certainly there. And when you go and you look at a map, right here is where the plane crash occurred right here in um Detroit, where the where the airport was, and this is Midland, Texas, and like, you know, at least the line, it goes, it doesn't go directly over Cuyoka Mounds, but if you were to drive there, you're certainly going to go over it. Here we have a picture of George Bush, you know, showing little baby Jessica holding her up in 1989, so two years later, still, you know, milking this story, this propagandized piece for whatever reason of baby Jessica, which is seemingly also tied into baby CC, which seemingly, um, uh, whether it hijacked or just intertwined itself with whatever the harmonic convergence was, you know, this is what we're seeing happen. Um, and so this brings me to, uh, Jessica Lynch, who here remembers Jessica Lynch. Jessica Lynch was, um, uh, it was a story right after 9-11. So after 9-11, there was the invasion of Iraq, and a lot of Americans were like, hey, why are we invading Iraq? Supposedly Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11. And this story came out of how this woman named Jessica um, Lynch was kidnapped by Iraqi forces. And then there was this, um, fantastical say, um, uh, operation by special forces who saved Jessica Lynch. And so that was the Jessica Lynch story. And then it came out that the whole Jessica Lynch story was just a media construction construct. It was a piece of propaganda. The story of Jessica Lynch's rescue was one of the most covered storylines during the war in Iraq. Um, and then like, you know, eventually came out that the story was just part of a propaganda effort. Um, here we see uh, on March 23rd, she was serving as a unit supply specialist with the 507th Maintenance Company when her convoy was ambushed. She was seriously injured and then her subsequent recovery occurred on April Fool's Day. You know, that's, that's what happened. So now we've got like another Jessica. Here we've got this bush meeting this Jessica. Here we've got this bush meeting this Jessica. You know, it's the, <laughs> you know, if you're familiar 
with the the movie Wag the Dog, this is this is what we're seeing. Like, you know, I, I certainly recommend everyone watch the movie Wag the Dog, uh, which came out in 1997, pre-9-11, um, before the Jessica Lynch story. But it's basically um, Wag the Dog is a political satire, black comedy um, film centers on a spin doctor and a Hollywood producer who fabricate a war in Albania to distract voters from a presidential sex scandal. So in this movie, it basically shows how, um, how easily, uh, how how easily stories can be created and the media can work together and not even know what the, that it's a fake that they can not everyone has to be a participant in a fake story to propagate a fake story and how easy it is for the um american public to buy it if you are familiar with wag the dog like one of the funniest scenes was like when they created this this song of um celebrities about this made up uh war hero exactly this jessica lynch story like this made up war hero with songs the same thing which you know which the bart simpson thing happened when they created the charity single it's like the same it's the same model it's like jessica lynch and jessica baby jessica possibly baby cc possibly um Virginia Dare, we're seeing this this theme happening as this interwovenness with with other occurrences occurring. You know, in this instance, the harmonic convergence, which is being tied into uh, which is being tied into um, the Jessica, the the baby Jessica, to the harmonic convergence, which is linked to this up and coming um, eclipse. So let me see, where am I right here? Uh, I also thought this was interesting. I mean, this is just like a, a, ti a, a tidbit. So I was searching, as I was pulling these slides together, I was like, all right, let me find the information on Flight 255. So I just searched in Wikipedia for it. And these were the two entrances that are the two uh, responses that came up. Northwest Flight 255, which was the one I was looking for. And then there was this other Quebec Air Flight 255. I'm like, oh, two 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 fifty fives and this other one is a plane crash and it happened on march 29th 1979 which coincided with march 28th 1979 which was three mile island which was you know very suspect in itself as well as being just a total psyop of some sorts this the three mile island occurring in the Susquehanna River in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Ironically, as I'm recording this, I have Three Mile Island in my, in my vision from the place which I'm located. Um, and again, like uh, Three Mile Island is also paid homage within The Simpsons. So where am I going with this? Like, you know, it's it's, I'm not really certain. That's why I said I'm unpacking this because there's something which is, which is building. Like there is undoubtedly, <laughs> there's a lot going on in the world right now. There's a lot going on in almost everyone's life that, you know, in my, per that I know in my personal circles, like there's just, it's an intense time to be alive. And we see this thing is beginning to, uh, to build up. So maybe I'm just saying like, you know, <laughs> be on guard for some story. I don't know. Uh, maybe which is going to be coming out soon. Take it with a grain of salt. Uh, what is the nature of this reality? I don't know. You know, the, these are the questions which I'm playing with. I'm going to continue to be looking into the eclipse and to these events. Um, uh, for those of you who are interested, like natural astrology is a way of connecting into the heavens and understanding them outside of story. To be able to look at astrology as an actual knowable timeline to move your mind outside of these stories which are all around us. Um, I just started a new class or I opened up a new class. I put a video out last week. A couple people have signed up. I've got a handful of spots left. If you're interested, you can sign up. Uh, send me an email if you want more details. 
Um, also, if you want uh, a, um, a starboard assessment of your personal uh, natal chart as it relates to this eclipse and the harmonic convergence, um, get in touch with me. All of that could be done on, um, on the Linktree link, which is included here. Uh, that being said, my friends, this felt like it was all over the place. I appreciate your, your, uh, ability to come along on this bumpy ride, but I'm just passing this information out as it's coming to me. Take good care, you know, be easy with yourself, be easy with other people. And, um, yeah, <laughs> I'll see you on the other side.